Thank you, Rob, and hello, everybody. It's a great delight to be back here um, talking to you. And uh, we're talking about the Mars and Moon, uh, the next giant leaps. So let's start with Mars. It's um, the Mars season again. Mars seasons come every, it's every 22 months. And um, in fact, if you stay up late tonight, you can see Mars. It's a good time of year to see Mars. Uh, it'll be rising tonight at 11 minutes past 11. And it will be up in the sky all night. It's very distinctive because it's red and really quite bright. If you do stay up late, you will also see if it rises in the east, it sets in the west. Um, also up in the sky at the moment, uh, Saturn and Jupiter are quite a show, along with uh, a waxing gibbous moon. So uh, if you have a dark sky tonight, and we've got a good chance of one, uh, there's something to look for. Okay, so Mars rising at 11 minutes past 11 tonight. That's in London time, slightly shifted forward or backward according to your longitude. Okay, let me move on because Mars season again also is very familiar because it means Earthlings tend nowadays to launch spacecraft towards Mars. This year is a bumper year. We've got three that have already left this month. Um, the first was Al-Amal, which means hope in Arabic, and was launched by a newcomer to the game, the United Arab Emirates. They will, uh, they're launched um, on the 19th of July, and all of these spacecraft that I'm gonna talk about will arrive in February next year. For the United Arab Emirates, they're celebrating 50 years since they ceased to be a colony of the United Kingdom. So haven't they done well? Uh, it's clearly, clearly remarkable. Um, and they're hoping for the next century at least to be playing a major role. Let me say a little bit about them. Their probe is called HOPE. There is its uh, decal, its icon. And um, I think we need a message from the head of department. I don't, hope you didn't see that. <laughs> um, it's focused at measuring the atmosphere of Mars from space. Uh, they've got a very focused series of questions. And of course, you say, but didn't Mars lose its atmosphere? That's, for an Earthling, a very important issue. Uh, they will be trying to analyze the structure of the atmosphere, comparing it, of course, with previous spacecraft, uh, and making a contribution to the world knowledge. Um, on Mars, there is a picture of their spacecraft, a uh, neat little object. I rather like this quotation because uh, I'm interested in astronomy, and I don't know whether anyone's noticed, but um, most stars have a name that originates from Arabic. Uh, Aldebaran, for example. Al, at the beginning, certainly isn't, means it's Arabic. So Arab civilization, in fact, uh, the years 800 to 1000, I suppose, once played a great role in contributing to human knowledge. And it's the intention of the United Arab, Arab Emirates government that Arabs shall play that role again, and let's hope they do. This certainly is a major leap for them, and uh, we trust it all works out very well. So that's just an orbiter. Now, here they had their launch. They don't have a launch site in Arabia in, on the Gulf. They launch from Japan, from the site in Tanegashima, which is right in the southern edge of Japan, it's the most beautiful launch site in the world, as you can sort of deduce. You could imagine you were in Cornwall or somewhere absolutely heavenly. And here is uh, the spacecraft taking off on July 19th. Okay, let's move on. 
The next player is China, and we'll come to China again in a little while. China has uh, launched a mission on the 23rd of July to Mars. Again, it will arrive in February. That's, I'm afraid, uh, the laws of uh, all the orbits, uh, Newton's laws of motion. Uh, all three spacecraft will arrive in February next year. And um, this uh, should, this is called Tianwen, uh, which means uh, heavenly questions. Uh, I love the way the Chinese name their missions, heavenly questions. Why didn't we Westerners think of that? Uh, they're certainly tackling heavenly questions because the intention is not only to orbit the planet, but to put a lander down on the surface. And uh, it's a small lander, of course. This is a first shot, but uh, let's wish them the best of luck. Of course, all of the knowledge is effectively pooled between all of the players. This is a humankind exploration of Mars. Right, now we come to the big player. What is coming in 2021 from Uncle Sam? Uh, you probably know they've got a large, uh, a, a large um, rover down there at the moment, Curiosity. There's going to be another one. That, it'll look very similar and land in much the same way as Curiosity using the Sky Crane. Um, but it's very exciting. The science is focused much more on geology and you can ask why is that and it's because they're going to cache that is hide away geological samples in order that probably within the next 10 years a spacecraft from a european and a american combined mission called mars sample return will land and go and fetch the samples and bring them back to Earth. That's to come within a decade, we hope. But what else, what else are they doing? Well, I advise the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and they said, we could, put a, we could put a helicopter on this. The advisory group I belong to said, that's crazy, because if the helicopter fails, they said, well, we're just demonstrating it. If it doesn't work, we're going to learn next time we'll do it right. I said, if the helicopter fails, it's what everybody's going to remember. Um, it'll make, uh, well, look, my advice was ignored, as was the rest of my advisory group. So here you are. I'm immensely excited about this Mars helicopter. It's called Ingenuity. I'm flying on a planet where there's almost no atmosphere certainly requires ingenuity. Here is the little baby. What it'll do, and it'll do this probably if this works, even when human beings land on Mars, it'll be used for scouting terrain, for looking for interesting things, for planning where the rover trundles along to. You know, here it's probably saying, don't move, don't move, go a different way. This is no good. Here you can see it does work, at least on the ground. They're defying the gravity of Earth, which is worse than that of Mars, in an atmosphere that's supposed to be as weak as Mars, which is almost a vacuum. There is the little baby flying up in the air. So we'll, my fingers are crossed for next February, when this little uh, item is tested on Mars. Remember, it's only a test. It's, uh, if it fails, tests, that's the reason you test, you find out. The really important thing that has to work is the rover, based on the technology of curiosity, perseverance, it's called, and then hiding, caching, the geology samples that eventually, I hope, will come back to Earth within a decade or a little bit more. Okay, for, so that's Mars. That's exciting enough. I'm sure I could have talked for 40 minutes about that. But what about the moon? 
Okay. Oh, I should add this. I thought this was very nice. This is a map of Mars, a sort of Mercator projection of Mars, showing a variety of landed systems. If you look, there's a yellow sign over here where Perseverance is due to land. And what is right next to it, I have to say, tens of kilometers away, is Beagle 2. This is going to be the next closest landing, or the next landing close to Beagle 2. It would be delightful, wouldn't it, if the little helicopter found Beagle 2. I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, I'm very fond of Beagle 2 and immensely miss its loss. 20, nearly 20 years ago, 17 years ago. Okay, let's move on. So that's Mars. So here we have a new moon race is on. Is China already ahead? I just love this picture. I'm not sure. It's, I don't know, astronomical telescopes and rockets and I don't know what on it. Um, it's from a very serious political sort of gossip sheet called Politico. And it's from about a year ago. I kept it because when the political gossip sheets are saying a new moon race is on, my ears prick up. So is China already ahead? Um, don't pose that as a question because the answer is not yet, as you're going to see. But anyhow, China is in the game. What we, of course, remember is the Americans have been to the moon. They landed successfully on the moon uh, six times and the first time on just about uh, 11 years, uh, 51 years ago, 1969. Why did they then cease to go back after Apollo 17? The Russians did wonderful things on the moon and they were in a race but manifestly, the landing of human beings on the moon was winning the race. And that kind of killed the interest in the longer term. The Russians did remarkable things. They had this wonderful robotic rover, the Lunachod, um, which there were two of them, and they trundled over the surface of the moon back in 1969. But by then, the, the race, however clever the Russians were, the race had been lost. So, in fact, the Americans went even better. The next year or two, they sent up these uh, lunar buggies. And uh, here is, I think, Dave Scott, uh, Apollo 15, driving the buggy. I love the, love the way he does a a handbrake turn, I think that would be called. And there he does another one as he hurtles around on the moon. He, in fact, doesn't hold the record for land, the land speed record on the moon. That's held by Gene Cernan of the Apollo 17, who managed to get this little baby up to 11 kilometers an hour. It looks much faster, doesn't it? Boy, that would have been fun. I would have loved to do that. Okay, let's come back to today. Let's uh, remember 60 years ago. Um, well, China has been doing great things on the moon. And I think it's, it's already made its mark um, simply because it did something nobody else had done and it landed on the far side of the moon. That isn't, I'm sad to say, the dark side of the moon. It's the side that is always away from us, but it has day and night, just like the side that looks at us. And um, if we were watching it from far away, we would see its phases, just like we watch the phases of the moon uh, on the surface of the Earth. So this is uh, the little uh, robot uh, rover. A uh, wonderful name, Jade Rabbit. If you're familiar with Chinese culture, that's not a surprising name. Uh, the Jade Rabbit uh, works on the moon for the goddess of the moon. 
who is exiled there by the emperor, if I remember correctly. Um, so Jade Rabbit, Tronroo around on the far side, that is in itself a major technological <laughs> achievement by the Chinese. So one can only wait. I would, wouldn't mind betting there'll be Chinese on the moon, Chinese people on the moon within a decade and possibly much sooner. But there's another player in the moon race, uh, the, Amer the Indians who've also, of course, been going to Mars. There's a Mars orbiter built by India going around the moon. Uh, what's very interesting with India is uh, the present government, but it's been effectively Indian policy since independence, believes in self-reliance. And there you see a picture, in fact, of um, one of their biggest rockets taking off. They've got a whole class of rockets, all Indian made, because they feel they have to be self-reliant. They use space, I think, very cleverly for managing such a complex country, um, because you can, it's the way to watch what's going on in your own country. It's, uh, for them, but also they believe in showing to their population that India is a high-tech nation. Um, a lot of the early work on India on launches was helped by the Europeans, and I love the fact that their rockets look remarkably like uh, the Ariane rocket uh, family of, uh, of Europe. Uh, they certainly learned from us, and I think we were very happy to help. Okay, so let me now come. Let me take you back to the United States. There is the Apollo rocket taking off, and there were the, the six missions that did make it to the moon. Um, and here we are. This uh, movie is about Artemis. Those of you with a classical education will know that Artemis is the sister of Apollo in Western Greek mythology. And why are they going to the moon? They're going because Artemis will take them there, but eventually they want to go to Mars. Mars is much further away. So practice using the moon here, a land, uh, the um, Orion module in which the astronauts will travel. Here is the service module, which is not widely known, not as well known as it should be, is being built by Europe. Then we see the uh, launch abort system so they can escape if something goes wrong at launch. And uh, there, here comes the rocket, um, or the series of rockets with its boosters. This is going to be the most powerful rocket in the world. It'll actually, it's called SLS, and uh, it is going to be even bigger than the Saturn V that took astronauts to the moon um, all those years ago. So this is going to show us what the Americans are planning. It's not what they've done, what they're planning. So here we see the uh, big rocket taking off, the uh, service module, which is European, going to fro around the Earth, and then it'll go off onto a trajectory to take it to the moon, checking out the propulsion systems and the power and so on. The power is provided by the service module, which, of course, is being built in Europe. In fact, one is already delivered to the United States for the first test flights. Um, the, uh, what it, in the long term, what the Americans intend to have is a space station orbiting the moon called um, Lunar Gateway. So instead of going direct to the moon, as Apollo did, they will eventually have an orbiter, an orbiting space station, 
and then they'll be able to hop out and go down to the moon, fly back to the orbiter, and then from there transship to go back to the uh, back to Earth, back to the home planet. Um, it's a dramatic activity. Europeans are already involved. In fact, Great Britain is taking part. Here is a picture of the uh, how the orbiter will look at the planet, uh, look at the satellite rather, rather than Apollo, which stayed in an equatorial orbit. So we'll get a full coverage of the moon from the lunar gateway, and then we'll have these astronauts exchanged and then landers sent down to touch down on the surface. This was all due to start. Uh, the first lunar landing was planned in 2028. Then the President of the United States, or rather his Vice President, decided to challenge NASA and say he wanted to see uh, Americans on the moon by 2024. That is four years earlier. Many, many, many times I thought, wouldn't it be fun to work for NASA? When I heard this, I was very glad I didn't. That's quite a challenge. NASA is working up to it, and it means the first missions will not use the gateway. They will go directly to the surface to get there by 2024. Um, it's a, a real challenge for NASA, and let's hope they can do it. Uh, certainly, I worked for the BBC on the coverage of Apollo while I was a student at Imperial, and uh, I just assumed there would be permanent presence on the moon of people 60 years later. It didn't occur to me otherwise. Okay, let me move on. There, just to show you, if this looks familiar, this is the European service module that we're providing as our contribution to this lunar exploration. But if it looks familiar, it's because it is. Um, it's based on the ATV transport that is you that's been used by Europe to service the space station, to take supplies and so on up, and that. Looks like an X-Wing fighter to me. I love the image, and um, this is head-on, of course, and that is something we Europeans are providing. Okay, let me... It's a little over five meters in di diameter, four meters high, so it, it is big. Uh, it weighs three and a half tons, and... Um, there's a main engine and then 32 smaller thrusters because it's got to be very maneuverable. It's got to be able to rendezvous with a lunar gateway successfully, or at least get the astronauts rendezvoused successfully. Uh, so it's quite, that's uh, quite an astronautical challenge for Europe. Okay, here are some pictures. Uh, height of a typical house, 7.3 meters. Um, you see what a person looks like standing against it, and um, there is uh, five elephants. I don't know why we measure weight in terms of elephants. Uh, anyhow, there it is, the elephant, the five elephants in the room of the Orion and its service module provided by ESA. Okay, four people will be able to go to the moon this way. That's more than, of course, uh, three people went with Apollo. So this is really Apollo's big sister, Artemis. And it's been said by the vice president of the US again, the first person to land on the moon, again, the first American will be a woman. Here's another, here is actually proof that um, we do things over with jointly as partners with the United States. This wonderful looking aircraft is called a Guppy and is more usually used for transporting wings for big Airbus planes from North Wales to, uh, to Toulouse where the B-52 
big Airbus planes are assembled. Uh, this is an Airbus uh, aircraft. Um, in fact, we Europeans have given it or bartered it, I think is the word, to the Americans in order that um, as part of our contribution to the cost of running the space station, this is partly our barter system. So there you are, a beautiful, I don't know if it's beautiful, a s substantial European aircraft with NASA written on the tail. I don't know that I ever would have expected to see such a thing, and I get a kick out of seeing it. What it's doing here, it's at a place called Plumbrook in Ohio in the United States. It has just loaded up, that whole front opens up, and they've loaded up the Orion capsule and the uh, service module to fly it down south, eventually to prepare for test launches that are coming up very soon. Okay, I'm now going to take you to the UK. What's the UK been doing? Well, it's doing a lot of things, but one of my favorites is Foster and Partners, Norman Foster. You're probably aware they're the architects that built the entrance, the atrium entryway from Exhibition Road into Imperial College. They are thinking about the architecture of living on the moon. Here is um, a, an entire schematic they've developed for the European Space Agency with the aim of eventually building habitations on the moon. Here is a little robotic uh, rover which will scoop up regolith and then uh, make the regolith fit for building uh, the place that is fit for astronauts to live in. Uh, here you can see the little uh, rover and um, coming up it's building the whole structure, uh, tamping it down and uh, creating the surface. It'll take about three months to build this. And the reason you've got to build it like an igloo is in order to escape the radiation that is hazardous. The Earth's atmosphere protects us from the worst things that the cosmos can throw at us. Uh, really, the sun does an awful lot of damage on the moon and there are meteoroids and all sorts of things. That's why you have to build that igloo-like structure out of the, the moon itself. And indeed, those lookouts, you can see the windows, the astronauts will have to stay away from those if there's a solar storm on. Uh, they'll be told to stay clear because the, the sun is being nasty to them. So there you are. It's what I expected by 2020 would be definitely up and running in 19, uh, in the 60s when I first started thinking about Apollo going to the moon. And um, we're not there yet, but maybe we will be. Uh, Foster and Partners. Thank you, Foster and Partners. Okay, that takes me to my end. And uh, I'd be very happy to uh, answer questions and uh, enlighten you as far as I can. Okay, so um, I think I probably should stop sharing the screen at this point. Okay. So over to you, Rod and uh, John. The first question we've got is from uh, Christina Bornberg. Um, how much will NASA have to compromise on science payload to meet the 2024 deadline? <laughs> That's a very profound question, Christine. <laughs> I, um, I don't know if you detected it, but there's landing on the moon certainly allows you to do some interesting science. Don't get me wrong. But it is not the primary purpose of... Um, there are two primary purposes. One, it may be that lunar geology will provide us evidence that the moon is worth mining. You know, if we come across um, unobtainium or something like that. Uh, 
some something that really we can't find on the Earth, then we might start working on the moon to bring it back to Earth. But the other reason I'm afraid uh, is national prestige. It's not just showing the other countries your number one, two, or three. It's also for people in the countries in question. Uh, I think uh, I know in India, where I worked with the Indians on their first lunar mission, Chandrayaan, uh, the head of the lunar, uh, the head of the Indian Space Agency said, every Indian can see the moon. Every Indian child can see the moon. If India can go to the moon, that will inspire them to work hard at school, to develop an interest in science and technology because they know Indians can do it. And I'm pretty sure with India, it isn't a question of showing they're better than the Americans so much as showing their own people that India can do such things. I think with the Chinese, it's probably more competitive with the US. Uh, certainly, um, I think China sees this century as the Chinese century. I think we concede that the last century, at least 50% of it was the American century. Uh, whether the Chinese are right is another matter. So the Chinese are doing it. So the American response has to be, I think, political. And so, Christina, I think they will compromise a lot of the science that might have been carried in order to make sure that they can get the astronauts safely down to the surface, safely back to the Earth. Um, because to not do so would certainly not carry the right image of the US. And Apollo went very successfully. Let's trust that Artemis does. Um, in fairness to the Americans, they have a flotilla of robotic spacecraft orbiting the moon simply in preparation for this major mission. And they are doing all sorts of science while they're there. So the Americans aren't throwing their science out completely. Uh, we've had a question from uh, Martin Keats. Uh, I think it's spelt wrong, but it's why is the ellipse, I think it is rather than eclipse, round the moon so large for the orbiting moon station? Oh boy, that was, show, that was shown from, in your diagrams. I couldn't have planted these questions better. <laughs> uh, the uh, the ellipse is that shape, partly because the intention is to make the lunar gateway, in the current plan, the staging point for ultimately going to the to Mars. And the further you are from the moon, the easier it is to get to Mars from there. So it is deliberate that you have this polar, you have the polar orbit also for another reason that I didn't mention, polar orbit going quite close to the moon where you drop down your astronauts, but it goes over the pole. That's because you can build a habitation at the pole of the moon and be in perpetual sunlight. And in fact, uh, that's rather important because the moon gets extremely cold at night and uh, it's pleasanter to be have the sun shining. So uh, that's the answer. Okay. Thank you. We've had a, a note uh, from a previous student of yours, Andy Belk, who's watching from California. Uh, oh. Welcome indeed. Thank you for making your presence known. Um, we have uh, a question from Richard uh, Barnford. Uh, how do you see SpaceX fitting into the overall picture? Um, That's the commercial side of it all. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think NASA has, um, SpaceX is fitting in by taking large amounts of money from NASA. <laughs> um, but at the same time, to be fair to the way the Americans do things, competition is rather good for getting rapid, creative, innovative answers to things. And so uh, NASA has 
been told by the US government to specifically encourage commercial companies to look at options to go into space. SpaceX is already getting a return on its money, its invested money by delivering cargo to the space station. NASA then pays for that delivery. It's a bit like Ocado turning up in the United Kingdom, you know, outside your door. Elon Musk turns up with his rocket and <laughs> delivers your um, delivers uh, the goods to the space station. Uh, there, they fit in simply because the Americans are creating a competitive environment. On the other hand, um, there are things that I guess the Americans, even the Americans, accept can only be done by Uncle Sam itself, and that is to build the kind of infrastructure they're looking at for the next um, two decades or so of lunar and possibly Mars exploration by human beings. So SpaceX has a part, as does uh, Jeff Bezos, as well as Elon Musk. Jeff Bezos, of course, is also interested in um, building uh, space systems. Uh, there are a variety of competitors. And indeed, Jeff Bezos is certainly interested in getting people to the moon also. We'll see. Maybe the American way works. I certainly hope it does. Okay. Uh, yes, we've got another question pretty much along the same lines from uh, uh, De Costa Tuff, who says, what extent do you think the space transport will be more privatized in the coming decade? Uh, do you think this is beneficial or detrimental? Um, <laughs> and I think you've uh, m more or less answered that. I've more or less answered it. I think it will become more present. Uh, it's a political question to ask whether I approve of it, but I'll answer it. I think, I think competition is good. I think that um, the way we function in the Western world generates innovation and competition, so I tend to think it's a good idea. On the other hand, uh, and indeed, we all now benefit from commercial air, well, before the lockdown, <laughs> benefited from the virtues of commercial aircraft builders, commercial civil aircraft builders. Frankly, they wouldn't be there if originally governments hadn't built aircraft. Uh, it's um, at some point, it's not a bad idea to hand over something the government does, has maybe done the pioneering work on, to uh, commercial operators. Uh, you have to then regulate them and make sure they behave. There's a lot of work for lawyers in that, actually, if anyone's interested in taking up law. But um, uh, frankly, I think it's uh, I think it, NASA hasn't made a mistake by uh, encouraging commercial activities. Thank you. Um, in fact, there is a question uh, uh, about law from uh, Sudeep Mohandas. Um, he's saying, will there be political borders instituted in terms of which country has a stake in landing on the moon and landing rights? Will there be an Earth administration for managing the moon? Uh, perhaps a little, will it be regarded a little like the, the Antarctic, which is only there, can only be used for scientific purposes? But many people are going to the moon partly to find uh, minerals. So what's, the, what's your- I point? think that's a key question. And it's the reason, Sudeep, I mentioned the, um, the need for lawyers in this. Uh, it's, um, we're not living in the 18th century when, you know, you could get on a sailing ship and get off on an island, put up the Union Jack and claim it for Great Britain. Uh, I think it'll, there will be lunar treaties, there have to be, but since in the long run I imagine much of lunar exploration will be done by cooperative exploration, I think the real problem won't arise until you get to the potential commercial exploitation. This is an issue in the Antarctic right now, as I guess people know. And uh, the scientific use of the Antarctic is uh, more or less generally accepted. Um, I think there's one country that doesn't quite accept it. 
And, um, uh, but if suddenly we start running out of, I don't know, some precious metal or whatever, rare earth, <laughs> rare earth, you see, might not be rare moon. Uh, if you start discovering this, then quite how one deals with the exploitation is an interesting matter. The one thing I'm fairly comfortable about, which would come up if we started exploiting Mars, is I don't really think the presence of human beings on the moon will foul up uh, any present life there, because I don't believe there's any life there. I'm mm. fairly well convinced of that. I think with the Mars, it's a much more troubling question. One does not want too many human spores on Mars before we really understand whether Mars once had life. And, um, you know, for me, that's one of the most fundamental questions of space exploration. But it would be different if we really needed to go to Mars to dig it up and bring it back to Earth for to sustain life for some reason on Earth. And another leap into the future um, uh, from uh, James Parr, who is asking whether there will be a change in the way rockets are fueled in the future and what uh, resources will they change in the future? They will change. Um, first of all, they're going to get the ones that we launch on the Earth will more or less have to get greener um, and less poisonous. Uh, there's much work being done on alternative uh, chemistry. Um, then on the, in terms of how we, if we try to sustain a colony on the moon, I don't think there's a real problem about doing it with chemical rockets. I do not believe you can sustain a colony on Mars with chemical rockets. They just don't get to and fro fast enough. So I think we will have to move to the next most powerful, well, the more powerful way of power, powering things, which is nuclear power. Um, there has been a fair amount of work done on this. Uh, probably nuclear electric um, systems that don't actually use nuclear fission or fusion, but simply generate electricity that then is used to uh, drive a motor, are probably the way you would build a way to service uh, a settlement on Mars in its early years until it becomes self-sustaining, if it can. Uh, so I think things will evolve. It's an area, if I were looking at a, starting my career again, I'm not, but if I were, I would sort of be thinking about because I think these issues are going to come up increasingly in the future. And they have implications for uh, what we do on Earth as well as what we do in exploring the solar system. The electrical motors are used uh, already in Earth orbit for the satellites that really make everyday life as comfortable it is as it is for us right now on the Earth. So the technology does feed to and fro there. Hey, thank you. Um, in line with future, Azad Ayub, uh, uh, one of our trustees and uh, members of uh, the Committee of Friends, has uh, posted a shortish question. It says, United States, Russia, China, India, who next? Well, you did say the UAE was one. Yes, I, I will be interested. It's interesting. The UAE's de declaration, they only set up, I mean, it, this is very hard to believe, at least it was for me. They set up their space agency in 2017 with the head of the agency tasked, you will land uh, you will send a probe to Mars by 2021 to celebrate the anniversary of our country gaining independence. Uh, happily, he took it on and happily he's got 
the uh, the orbiter on its way to Mars. But at the same time, there was a declaration that throughout the next century until 2117, the UAE will contribute to the final development of a human satellite settlement on the surface of Mars. That's thinking grand. And um, uh, so I would bet that um, you can assume that there's going to be a UAE a continuing involvement. The Japanese will be continuing to be involved. The Europeans. Um, question for us is now we're out of Europe, whether we declare our independence and start a separate British effort. I don't know. That's something for Britons to answer, not for me. Mm. But um, China is going to go on being in the race. India, I'm sure. Um, but it's in the end, the knowledge will accumulate and it'll be the human exploration of our nearest space. Yes. Well, uh, the couple, there's one odd question from uh, Nick Marley who, who says, have Russia completely dropped out of the space race or are they collaborating with others? But in fact, as they've been acting, acting as a taxi service for the last 10 years to get people up into space, I'm, I, I'm wondering what are the back, back of that question. Perhaps there's something I'm missing. No, uh, the Russians aren't out of the game. In fact, COVID-19 prevented a joint European-Russian mission taking off this week to Mars with a rover, a rover that's basically built in Stevenage in Hertfordshire, it's on the north of London. Uh, it's a joint Russian-European collaboration. Uh, COVID-19 came at exactly the wrong time. The launch would have been from, uh, from Kazakhstan, from the Russian space base there, but you've got to do a lot of assembly and so on and bring stuff together and work together. It was felt this, given the schedule and the impact of COVID-19, uh, that this would be better deferred for two years. So in two years time, you can invite me back and I'll be telling you about the Russians and the Europeans going to Mars. Uh, that's uh, the, the, the rover is named after a Briton, Rosalind Franklin. And uh, I'm dreadfully sad really that it isn't going this month. It would have gone in the last couple of weeks. Um, but on the, when you're spending so much public money putting together such grand things, it's better safe than sorry, I think. So I'm not really criticizing the decision to delay. And I, I understand from another question that uh, India is, is planning to send a man, a man to the moon or humans to the moon. Is, is, is that right? Uh, that's very long term for them, as far as I know. Uh, they are planning to have Indian astronauts, of course, in the first instance, simply in Earth orbit. Uh, but Indians sent up by Indians, if you see what I mean. It's this philosophy of self-reliance that India has. And so um, I think... Uh, it wouldn't surprise me in the long term, but I think that's a long term issue. It does it won't stop the Indians sending robots to the moon and orbiting the moon. But people I think is going to be longer term. Well, David, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, uh, that terrific presentation. Um, we've had a, a good number of questions. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, and lasting the pace by the look of it, there's 93 of us uh, watching now. Thank you very much for, uh, 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 from Friends of Imperial College. Uh, you may know that, uh, of course, our f f finances took a dip after COVID.
coronavirus. And if you visit our website and uh, would like to contribute uh, some, uh, some uh, makes a contribution to our funds, it would be very welcome if you enjoyed this event. I'd like to say that we're organizing another talk in two weeks time. I think it's going to be on the four, Friday the 14th, but it's probably not at four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, Guillermo Rain will be talking about the world on fire. Um, and uh, he's spoken to us uh, before and we look forward to rejoining. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, David.